What is up, everybody? We are in Matthew. We're going through the themes of Matthew. We're going through like a week-by-week self-paced Bible study. And so week number one is the overview of Matthew. And so what we're going to be covering today is the structure of Matthew, the big themes of the book, what Matthew really dives into, kind of the structure uh, of Matthew itself, like how the book is organized, what Jesus talks about. We're going to be pointing out how Matthew is a really uniquely Jewish gospel and uh, stick around to the end where we talk about some different sections in Matthew that really point to how Jesus really was instead of this watered down, uh, goofy version of Jesus, uh, you know, the neutered Jesus or the tame Jesus that a lot of people are pushing these days. So we'll talk about that at the end. But uh, with that, let's jump into it. Looking at Matthew, it is mainly split up into five discourses, and one of the the main idea of these discourses are that there are five sections of Jesus' teaching throughout Matthew. Uh, Some of you might know that the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, that this is unique to Matthew, that this is a a feature of Matthew's gospel, and it's really Jesus' teaching about how to behave. It's a big sermon on bright behavior and practical righteousness and and how to live life as a Christian and what it looks like to to live life in the kingdom, which is a theme that we see repeated in the parables as well. Jesus gives us examples in the parables of what kingdom life is like. So these five discourses are broken down, and one thing that I found useful was there are actually five questions. So a lot of theologians and, and people studying Matthew break this down into five questions that each discourse answers. And the first question is, how do kingdom citizens live? So the first discourse talks about how Jesus tells us to live. Um, the second one is, how are disciples to conduct themselves? So Jesus has teachings about discipleship and sending disciples out into the world, what ministry looks like, his charge to his disciples for spreading the gospel and doing uh, the ministry here uh, you know, on earth during that time. The third question is, what parables did Jesus teach? So there's a huge section of parables in Matthew, and that's one of my favorite sections of the book because the the parables just teach us something specific about the kingdom of God. And it's just interesting when you put that lens on it because growing up in Sunday school and and learning these parables, oftentimes there's like a moral lesson associated. But and and while that's true, and I don't want to you know, say, you know, don't learn any morals from the Bible. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is if you focus just on that, you kind of miss what Jesus is saying about the kingdom. And so I think that those things tie in together. So uh, there's a section on that. That's the third discourse. The fourth discourse is about warnings that Jesus gave and uh, his talks on forgiveness. And then the fifth discourse is the Olivet Discourse. And that's Jesus's prophecy. How will human history end? What do the end times look like? What is coming for the disciples? So he talks a lot about that. Um, And then like all Gospels, so we have the structure of the five discourses. And um, when we look at that structure, it's kind of like those are five sections that are set into the overall story of Matthew, which starts with the genealogy of Jesus. But like all Gospels, Matthew starts to slow down and really focus on the last week of Jesus' life quite a bit after it gets through those discourses. There's a lot of time spent on the crucifixion, the passion narrative. The the Matthews, you know, starts off with Jesus' birth, uh, which is interesting. I think all four Gospels do, but they spend different amounts of time on Jesus' birth and genealogy, things like that. So the genealogy in Matthew is kind of interesting because it's actually set up in a very specific way. And it's not what you normally think of as the Christmas story in Matthew. Um, And it kind of points out that we kind of mash the Gospels together a lot of times. We take these ideas that we see in Luke and John and kind of put them together into one story. And we know the Christmas story, I think, better than we know the timeline of the Gospels. You know, that's kind of an interesting takeaway I had was, wow. I didn't realize I combined all the Gospels into this one Jesus story, right? And um, I think it's good to understand them holistically and and all together, but I also think it's good to understand the uh, the uniqueness, the the different flavor that each Gospel brings to the story. But anyway, so the genealogy in Matthew is very interesting, and it it really points to Jesus' authority. 
and there's this theme of kingly authority there. And Joseph gets a lot of screen time in this one because he's actually the one, like normally Mary gets all the credit, but Joseph gets a lot of credit in Matthew because he's the one that ties Jesus to the line of King David. So the genealogy, we see a lot of references to Moses and the Exodus as well as to King David. And there's a large, um, after the genealogy, we have, there's a large section of teaching and narrative on Jesus's life. And so it's about the beginning of his ministry in the Sermon on the Mount, which is the first discourse. So it goes through that in light of the kingdom teaching that he has in his um, beginning of his ministry and the Sermon on the Mount, he's actually starts talking about the kingdom a lot. And this is an interesting point. I want to make it explicitly clear here because this is something I didn't pick up for a long time. Jesus's main message of his ministry was repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message. That's why he spends so much time talking about the kingdom of heaven being here. So Jesus brought the kingdom of heaven. So there's a large section of teaching there. The Sermon on the Mount, you know, lots of uh, parables begin. Uh, He starts with those and tells a lot of parables about the kingdom of heaven. And again, this idea of the parables are illuminating us and and kind of uh, giving us examples of how life is in the kingdom of heaven. So in light of the kingdom, Jesus gives many teachings on forgiveness, practical righteousness, what characteristics people exhibit in the kingdom, as well as some warnings and consequences. Like anybody that says that hell is not real or judgment isn't real or Jesus didn't come to judge should really read Matthew because there's a lot of evidence here that Jesus is saying there is a coming judgment. Be careful. And then lastly, after all the the teaching, obviously, we come to the crucifixion, the resurrection and the Great Commission. So Jesus is is killed on the cross and the crucifixion. He's resurrected, and then he gives the Great Commission to go out and disciple the nations. Again, some some of the major themes that we pick up throughout the book and that you can take a look at here um, are different things that that really tie into Jesus' teaching. Matthew spends a lot of time on one theme of establishing Jesus' authority. So from the genealogy through his teaching with authority and the way that Matthew presents Jesus as one having authority, uh, even more authority than the Pharisees and scribes exhibit. And so there's a lot of that throughout this. And that comes from Matthew being a Jew and having a Jewish audience. He ties in a lot of prophetic references and um, it's almost like a, he presents almost legal evidence of Jesus's authority here on earth. And this idea that Jesus came to have authority in heaven and on earth. So there's a big theme of establishing Jesus' authority. There's the theme of how to guide, of being a disciple. Matthew spends a lot of time going into how do we be disciples of Jesus? What does that look like? So there's a lot of of, uh, discourse and teaching and pointing out of the things that Jesus tells his disciples to do. Uh, There's also the theme of Jesus bringing a new age and a kingdom. So with Jesus's birth, death on a cross, resurrection, great commission, he's bringing about a new age. And uh, one of the things that we pick up in the Olivet Discourse is that Jesus is bringing the kingdom. Like the kingdom is being brung now. (laughs) Like the kingdom is here. It's at hand. But it's not complete. And so while the kingdom arrives, it's coming to fruition. God's sovereign plan is bringing about the fullness of the kingdom. So there's also the guide on practical righteousness. There's a lot of uh, Jesus laying out the law in a way that, I hate to break it to you, but basically the way I put it is no one's getting out alive. The way that Jesus lays out the law, he says, you know, you've heard it said, right? You've heard the law explained this way, but I'm here to tell you it's even worse than that, all right? You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I tell you that if you even look at somebody with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. I mean, who has been a teenage boy, heard that, and not been shaken to the the core. I mean, think about that for a second. So anyways, this idea that nobody's getting out alive, nobody's perfect in the law. And then he spends a lot of time, there's another theme, pictures about the kingdom of heaven. So since Jesus' main message is about the kingdom of heaven, there's a lot of time he spends describing this kingdom and what it looks like to live in the kingdom. The themes here are, are... spread throughout the book, and there's different evidence in different sections for for each of those themes, but, um, you know, some of the, the key sections 
for the theme of like how to being a disciple. One of my favorite things that themes in Matthew is the how to be a disciple theme. Uh, he's teaching on the Beatitudes about the law, the intent of the law, pointing out over and over again that you've heard it said, but I say, right? Like this explaining that you live this law, you expect others to live this law, but you're a hypocrite. You live this law and you expect to live this law, but you're not, you're missing the point here. You're missing the point of the law. But with these themes, one very interesting theme is that uh, Matthew is a Jew writing to a Jewish audience. And the audience for each of the Gospels is a little bit different. So when we look at that, that's almost what gives the Gospel its flavor because different people are going to pick up on different things. The Jewish heritage is clearly influencing the Gospel of Matthew. It points out that Jesus came to spread his message again amongst the Jews first, right? It upholds this idea of um, Israel being God's chosen nation. It points out the prophecy and the law, the Old Testament references that support Jesus' authority. It highlights how the people who respond are not Jewish in a lot of cases, right? That the message is being spread to all nations. Matthew being a Jew, writing to Jews, there's strong emphasis on all these different clues that a Jewish audience would pick up. This is very strong in the genealogy where it's tying Jesus to King David, Moses, and all these different characters, right? Jesus himself shows that Genesis is, is active. Jesus draws on the, the Jewish stories, the Old Testament, all the way back to Genesis to support uh, the intent behind his law. So basically, he's pointing out that God has always had this standard. God has always had this law. Ever since creation happened and the word was spoken and everything came into existence, that this ordered creation has, has been, uh, what's been at the heart of this ordered creation is God's intent of the law to have a, to have a, a very good creation, a very good thing that's pure and in communion with him, reconciled to him. So there are many ties to Jesus fulfilling all of the different roles that Israel needs him to fulfill, whether it's King David's earthly authority, um, like the kingly authority of, of King David, whether it's the prophetic and law-giving authority of Moses, whether it's the tie-ins to Elisha or Abraham, like all these different tie-ins to Jesus' different roles and the roles in which he fulfills the, this for Israel is front and center to this Jewish audience. And what's interesting about this is also Israel's failure to live up to these standards is pointed out in the many Gentile characters that come along. He is starting with the beginning of Matthew with his genealogy. There are actually several Gentile women and Gentiles named in his genealogy that played very prominent roles in the Old Testament in bringing about the Messiah. From the beginning of Matthew as well, there are tie-ins to this idea that Israel, it's not just about Israel. Israel's the chosen son that's going to bring this about. And really, when you think about it, the, the vessel for that is their rebellion. The vessel for bringing about God's purpose and plan here is the rebellion of Israel role in charging Jesus, the son of God, with blasphemy and then crucifying him on the cross. Um, and if that doesn't blow your mind, the son of God being crucified for the charge of blasphemy, then I don't know what to tell you. That's, that's just crazy to me. That's Matthew, a uh, little bit about the overview. And then one last thing and right here at the end, I want to do talk about this because a lot of times today we see that people want to point out that Jesus is super cuddly and super nice. But the Gospel of Matthew has lots of examples of Jesus being about as cuddly as a cactus. Whether it's calling Pharisees broods of vipers, these would have been religious leaders getting it wrong, okay? He's calling them out, whether it's him cleansing the temple, whether it's him calling the disciples dunces, whether it's him sl like slinging racial slurs at women who want help. Like, it doesn't really matter. This idea of Jesus being a nice, nice guy is completely debunked in Matthew. So if you're holding on to this idea that being nice is God's idea of love, that sacred cow is being slaughtered with this gospel. In addition to the fact, if you think Jesus is just this nice guy, there are many examples in this book that you can look for to support you saying, actually, Jesus was a lion. It's the line from C.S. Lewis, uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I always come back to this because it's so powerful and to me illustrates the principle very well, which is this. And they're asking about Aslan and they say, Aslan, but he's safe, right? And the beavers say, child, dear heavens, no, he's, he's a lion. He's not safe, but he's good. 
So this idea of Jesus' character being developed in the, the Gospel of Matthew, I think, is really powerful as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off for today. But that's the Matthew overview. We're going to jump into it here shortly and uh, look out for the next theme videos as they come out. And hopefully you get something out of the self-paced Bible study. Like and subscribe if you're still watching, please. And I will catch you in the next video. All right. Peace.